Hey everyone, we're looking at centripetal forces in this section here, and we did the tape challenge today where you rolled a ball around the inside of a curve, and the question was, where does this ball want to go? As soon as you lift the edge of the tape, where is the ball going to travel? And we've seen, due to your inertia, objects in motion want to stay in motion. They want to stay in straight line motion. So when you lift that up and the circle disappears, that marble wants to go off tangent to the circle. That's why it's called a tangential or linear velocity because your object wants to maintain and leave the circle if ever possible. So we said no. When things are in circular motion, they cannot be in equilibrium. We saw in all our force diagrams that we saw unbalanced forces and unbalanced forces lead to constant accelerations. So we'll have a steady acceleration as we go around there and since we have a centripetal force, the centripetal force will cause us to centripetally accelerate. In class, we did all the force diagrams for these four examples. So make sure that if you didn't do it in class, you have the four examples for which force is causing the centripetal force. In the skip it, we said tension was the centripetal force for the car going around the bend. We said friction is what keeps you around the circle. For the moon going around the earth, gravity is the cause of you going in a circle. And for your clothes in the dryer, we said that the support of the walls is what keeps you and forces you in towards the center of the circle. So that's what you want to do in each problem. Centripetal force is no new force. It's just another name for the net force. It's the name for the net force of objects traveling in circular motion. And in this example, like we talked about in class, you see there's a tension and gravity as this ball swings around. And really, the net force there is pointing in towards the center of the circle. And that net force is actually the X component of tension. So even a part of your tension can be the force that causes you to go in a circle. The equation for centripetal force is no different than any other net force. Net force makes mass accelerate. But since this is a centripetal net force or a central net force pulling, pushing inwards, it's mass times centripetal acceleration. The equation then would be mass times v squared over r. v squared over r being our centripetal acceleration that we got back in chapter 3. And the reason that we're, uh, we are accelerating this time is because we are constantly changing direction. We're not changing our speed at all. We're changing how quickly our direction goes from pointing one way to another. And do you hear that? Oh, the song you're hearing. That is from the liar. Faith Hill lies to you. There is no such force called a centrifugal force. Listen to it again. Centrifugal? Really? Right here, it's a centripetal. I can see it in the word. Centripetal. P. P. Centripetal force. Pushing. Pulling. Centrifugal? A fake feeling force? There's no such thing. What the centrifugal force she's talking about is that fake force that throws objects out of the circle. There is no force that tosses you out of a circle. It's your body just trying to maintain and do what it was last doing. So what I mean by that is, go back to the car example. If you're in a car and the car is going forward, everything in that car wants to maintain straight line motion. If the car takes a sharp bend, everything in the car does not want to go in the circle. Everything in the car wants to continue going straight. And since it tries to continue to go straight, you run into the wall. You get stuck against the side of the car. You hit the car door. So you push car. The reaction force is the car pushes you. Which way does the car push you? The car pushes you inward, centrally, towards the center of the circle. The car pushing you in is the centripetal force. The outward push there, it's just your body trying to keep maintaining the straight line motion. So you try to go in a straight line, but the wall comes and hits you and pushes you in towards the center of the circle. But that force is equal and opposite, and that's the third law pair there for you pushing the car and the car then pushing you back. So there's an example of 
third law of motion. And it doesn't help when you have things like this shown to you because they call this device a centrifuge. Or if they take your blood and they put it into a whirling device, it's called a centrifuge as well. Because what happens is all the heavy material gravitates towards the outside of the circle and all the lighter stuff goes to the inside of the circle. Or in this case, they're trying to spin you so fast that you feel like you weigh much heavier, like if you were taking off in a spaceship. I can see where the terminology can get you, but never, never call it a centrifugal force. It's an inward centripetal force. Centripetal is the way you properly need to say that. So let's do the problem here with this car. This car is rounding a bend. The bend here is 45.7 meters in radius. The question here would be, what is the safe velocity? How fast can you go around this bend and not have your inertia take over and maintain that straight line motion and leave the circle? So how strong must friction be to keep you in towards the center of the circle? So let's show how that can work. Here's the force diagram. You've got gravity down, you've got the support up, and friction force inwards towards the center of the circle. So in this case, friction is your centripetal force. So the force of friction equals our centripetal force. Friction, we know we can just solve by doing mu times the normal force. And centripetal force is a net force, so you just do m v squared over r. If you look at your force diagram again, in this case, normal force does equal the force of gravity since they are up and down with each other and there's no other vertical component. So here we've got mu times the normal force equals mv squared over r. In this case, the normal force is equal to mg. So we've got mv squared over r equal to mg. There's mass on both sides, so it actually does not matter or how large your car is. This works for smart cars, tow trucks, big tractor trailers. As long as they go the speed I'm about to show you, they'll safely go around the bend. If I want to solve for velocity, move the radius over and I get mu g r equals v squared. So the safe speed to go around a bend is that, the square root of mu g r. As long as it's a nice, flat, horizontal road, that's as fast as you can travel and maintain circular motion. In our example was what, 45.7 is our radius. We know g, let's just give a mu of 0.8, saying that you have decent tires. So if we crunch out 0.8 times 9.8, times that radius, you get a safe velocity of about 18.9 meters per second. So it looks like around 40 miles an hour is the safe speed to round that bend. If you want to maintain faster speeds as you go around bends, increase the radius. Let's you travel faster around those bends. So on the turnpike, you see very wide curves. The reason they're so wide is because your velocity is up around 70, 80 miles an hour. When you're on the local roads, the local roads may have a very, very short radius. You'll see things like we said in class today, there could be a road that has a 10 mile an hour speed limit as you round the bend. That's because they did this formula here and figured out the safe speed to round that bend. Another famous example here is swinging the pail of water up and over your head. And if you have the water in the bucket and you start swinging it, the water in the bucket wants to maintain straight line motion but the bucket itself forces the water to maintain its motion. So what we have here, just your ordinary bucket of water. If you don't believe me, there are the drops. What I'm gonna do is swing this bucket up and around my head. As long as I go at a decent enough speed, the water should stay in the bucket because it's trying to maintain straight line motion, but the bucket walls get in the way. and the water is still in the bucket. So when we have a vertical circle and we send something up and over our head, if I have a spring scale in the bucket, you can watch the force change as we go up and around. When we do this, we must assume that this net centripetal force is constant as we go around the circles. And really, the centripetal force comes from the contributions of all the forces at different points in its motion. So if this is our example here, we've got the bucket at four different spots as it goes around the bend 
and we know that the bucket wants to maintain straight line motion, but we've got some forces on it. What I was doing was, well, one force we can list is always everyone's favorite, force of gravity. Force of gravity always acts downwards and tries to pull things back to the surface of the earth. We've got gravity down, and while I was swinging that bucket, there was a tension. The tension was in my arm. When the bucket was here, I was pulling inwards. When the bucket was over here, I was pulling inwards. When I was up top, I was actually pulling the bucket down to maintain the circular motion. And at the bottom, so that the bucket didn't fly through and off the handle, I actually had to pull up at that moment. If you look at these four examples here, the two sides are the easiest. The centripetal force are these two. The tensions are the centripetal force on the left and right sides. However, when we go up top, you see a tension in towards the center of the circle and gravity in towards the center of the circle. So at the top and bottom, those two have to add to create our centripetal force. So the centripetal force is made of gravity and tension. And down at the bottom, you've got tension upwards in towards the center of the circle, but you also have gravity in line with the centripetal force. So you do have to account for it in both cases. At the top, you'd have force of gravity downwards. You'd have tension downwards. What that does is it makes the mass accelerate centripetally downwards. So if I wanted to solve for the tension in my arm, the tension would end up equaling the centripetal acceleration times m minus mg. I wouldn't have to use all of my force, my tension force, to make this object accelerate around the circle because gravity is helping me go up and around the circle. The minimum that I could go up and around the top would be if my tension would equal zero. That means that mg would equal mv squared over r. And if that's the case, I can, again, eliminate the mass, and the speed is right there, the square root of g times r. That's the minimum speed to go around the top of the circle without using any tension whatsoever, just letting gravity take you through a circle. If you were do making a loop-to-loop -loop for a roller coaster, you could use this formula to figure out how fast you'd have to be traveling at the top so that when you're going around the top, your body still wants to try and maintain circular motion and only gravity is causing the centripetal force. Roller coaster designers do not use this speed to create their loops because that's a minimum speed. If there was anything that would slow down the roller coaster at all, air, friction from the track, then you'd have to go a little bit faster than this as you go up and around the bed. At the bottom, what we've got is tension upwards and gravity downwards, but this time the centripetal acceleration is up in towards the center of the circle. So when we look at this and I solve for my tension, my tension is the weight of the bucket plus the mv squared over r. So that means not only does my arm have to hold the weight of the bucket, but it also has to add in an extra mv squared over r. So I have to pull even harder at the bottom because that bucket wants to maintain straight line motion and go through the bottom of the circle, and I have to lift not only the bucket's weight, but also give it some centripetal force upwards to maintain the circular motion. So you pull a lot harder at the bottom than you do at the top. And the tension example at the top and the bottom can be examples of how you feel in a roller coaster as you go around the loop-to-loop. -loop. So as you get to the top, of the loop-to-loop. -loop. Your body wants to go straight and gravity's forcing you down through the loop. You feel a little bit lighter. Think of the tension like the support force of your seat. The support force is down, gravity is down, so your seat doesn't have to push on you as hard, which means that you feel a little bit lighter than normal. Contrast that with the bottom of the circle. Now you want to go down through the bottom of the track. Gravity is pushing down, and you have a support force, or in my case it was the tension force, pushing back up. Since I'm trying to go through the bottom of the car as the car is leveling off, the seat has to hold my weight, but then it has to also push and force me back up into the center of the circle to maintain my circular motion. 
so you feel a lot heavier at the bottom. Remember, your stomach is a great indicator of inertia. So at the bottom, your stomach wants to keep continuing down through the bottom of the track. So you feel very heavy and you feel your stomach sink to your feet. On the top, your stomach wants to maintain straight line motion as you start to dip back down. So just like on the elevator, you feel that the stomach runs right up into your throat as you go, as your body drops through the loop. Fighter pilots feel this. You feel it on a roller coaster. You feel it as you're going around any circular motion. As you round bends, your body wants to maintain that straight line motion due to your inertia, and there's got to be some centripetal force to keep you and force you to go in that circle. So the question could be, how much tension is in Spider-Man's web? We can analyze this as a vertical circle. So here we have Spider-Man swinging through the city. He shot out a 200-foot web as he's swinging through his arch. So he's going this way and traveling in that circular path. But remember, at any moment, his velocity is tangent to the circle. So if that's his cruising speed of around 50 miles an hour, comes out to around 22.3 meters per second, which is about a 61 meter long web. So what we want to focus on is what is the maximum tension Spider-Man has in his web? Well, the maximum tension would occur down here at the lowest point. At the lowest point, you'd have tension in the spider web up and you'd have gravity pulling downwards. To maintain circular motion, the tension's got to be greater than the force of gravity. So what we can do here is set up our equation, minus mg equals mv squared over r. We know the speed of Spider-Man. We know his radius as he's moving his way through the arc. How big is Spider-Man? So Spider-Man is around 160 pounds. So 160 pounds correlates into about 73 kilograms. So if I put that in for my mass, I have everything I need. The tension in Spider-Man's web would be 730 newtons, just in his weight, plus the mv squared over r. Comes out to an extra 595 newtons. Not only does Spider-Man's web have to support his weight, but it has to add up and hold 1,325 newtons of force, which comes out to around 300 pounds of force, is the tension in Spider-Man's web when he reaches the bottom of the circle. However, he usually catches the damsel in distress at the bottom of his circle. Not only would he have to hold up his own weight, he'd actually have to hold up the victim at the same time. So he'd have to hold whoever he catches plus he'd have to hold up himself and also maintain circular motion. So you'd have to add an extra mg here for the person that he catches. And the total mass that is accelerating must be both their masses combined. So that web is going to pull up a lot more than just 300 newtons.